Hi, my name is Angela Skibris and I am known as the kinesiologist. It's so nice to be here with you today. I'm actually beyond excited uh, to have a very special guest with us today, uh, Jerry Mazinski, uh, someone who I've just spent the last maybe three or four months, I came across Jerry uh, in some interviews, which really piqued my interest um, just with a few experiences I've had over my time. And I thought, wow, there's something here and something that I think is an important message for us all to understand more about mental health and uh, mental wellness and how we can make a difference um, to our wellness. So I finished reading this incredible book here. Uh, it does look backwards for the rest of you guys, but this incredible book that Jerry and Sherry, is it Swiney, Jerry? That's Sweeney. Sweeney, thank you. Yeah, yeah she um, doesn't like she doesn't like Swiney. <laughs> I'm just thinking that would be no, she'll go, if you say Swiney, she'll go off on you. <laughs> Sorry, Sherry. <laughs> I'm sure she's far from that type of lady. Um, yeah, sorry, Sherry, my apologies. I should have checked that before I press the record button. But an amazing journey into the psychotic mind, breaking the spell of the ivory tower. As you can see with all my, my tags and tickets, I've devoured this book and enjoyed every second of it. And there's so much there for us to learn about how we can There's, the, there's it. an interesting story with Sherry. I, I knew her for 10 years. We were working wow. on prison reform. Yeah. And, and then... You know, I would tell every once in a while about the patients I had working in psych in the in the state prison. And uh, one day she goes, oh, I, I know about those voices. And I said, well, how do you know about those voices? She said, I heard them when I was a young gal. I said, what? Wow. She's one of the most spiritual people I know. You know, very bright. She's an engineer. And I'm like, you got to be kidding. So I, I kind of like half believed her. It's like, no, no, this can't be. And so I started throwing all these questions at her that only somebody who heard the voices would know. Yeah, would know. And she's yeah. like, bam, 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 one after another. And I'm like, just what? Whoa. You know, it, it's like, uh, so, you know, we got to talking about it and said, <clears throat> well, you know, we need to we need to do something with this. We need to let people know. Yeah. You know, so we, we worked on that book for over two years. It drove me half crazy. And, uh, <laughs> But I think we got the gist of it down, how, how we came to the conclusion that these voices were not hallucinations like the psychiatric mafia insists. If they're running well-defined patterns, and they do, they run like 30 well-defined patterns, they can't be hallucinations. Something is holding them to those patterns. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we're going to dive into today. I think this is one of the most extraordinary conversations, and I just look at I want to read uh, Jerry's biography and make sure I get it correct. So BA, um, uh, Master of Education. So Jerry's a retired licensed psychotherapist. So anyone who, you know, you've picked up on this on this conversation, you think to yourself, this has to be a bunch of woo or people, you know, coming from super, you know, spiritual side of the world, um, but with no grounding in, you know, um, medical experience or whatever that's not where we're at here jerry is someone with 40 years experience on the ground in in his own uh research and ex and, and personal experiences of these happening uh these things happening and from what you've said jerry it wasn't something like the whole concept of the voices that uh people were hearing it's not something you came to easy to to think that it was oh, something oh no. other than other than an illness like no matter of fact i was i was i was in denial for the the better part of 20 25 years i didn't want to believe it you know it's like uh i, I didn't want you know i wasn't a super religious person but i wasn't a, a atheist either and uh the, here's these patterns started emerging once i started talking to these guys you know one after another after another and i'm like what's going on here you know, if they're hallucinations, they can't be, the, the, these patterns shouldn't exist. I mean, I've seen plenty of hallucinations working in the ER, working in where I did. These weren't hallucinations. These people were, the voices were talking in complete um, sentences. You know, they there was a conversation going on. I remember, you know, they didn't mention hardly anything about schizophrenia in, in, the, in the four years of psychology I had two years of master's degree, and then the PhD program was even worse. I mean, it was piled higher and deeper. They didn't have any idea what was really going on, you know, and what 
what I saw on the front lines, I'd, I'd, I'd already spent seven years working in, this was the biggest psychiatric hospital on the planet. There were 10,000 patients there when I got there. It was the size of a small city. You know, it was in central Georgia, Central State Hospital. And there was every mental illness known to man in there. So for somebody interested in abnormal psychology and being a, an adrenaline junkie at the same time, <laughs> that was like heaven for me. It's like, what's going on with this one? What's going on with that one? But the most intriguing were the schizophrenics, you know, <clears throat> and they didn't say hardly anything about that in, in formal, you know, psychology. It's like they said, well, well, there, there, there's a chemical brain imbalance and they're having hallucinations. Yeah. You know? And uh, it, you know, when, once I got there, so after graduate school, well, my, my distrust started earlier than that. Um, I remember one time in undergraduate, so what I hated about undergraduate psychology is you couldn't check out anything they were teaching you. You couldn't go into a lab and see it like the engineers can do or the or the biochemists can do. You, you, you know, you, you're given all these books and they're saying, memorize this stuff and spit it back out. You know? And I'm, I'm like, well, there was no way to test it. There was you couldn't access a clinical population. You couldn't go into a mental health center and say, "Listen, I want to talk to a schizophrenic and see what's going on." Yeah. You couldn't go into a prison or a jail and do. They won't let you in. They won't let you into a state hospital if if you're not a relative. And uh, you know they they make it low. Oh, it's super dangerous, and you're going to no no. I spent you know thirty five forty years in there. I was never hurt except once when I provoked it, and it was my fault. And even then I wasn't hurt. It was just a close call, you know? And then one of the nurses was, when they, they told her, when you go on the psych ward, don't look anybody in the eye. You know, it's like, like very scary. They make it very scary. It's, it's like crazy what happened. So the first time I, I ran into the, the distrust head on was, in undergraduate school, a clinical psychologist has written this paper stating that if two, uh, two patients with the same delusion met each other, you know, like if, uh, you know, both of them thought they were Justin Trudeau or something like that, one of them would have to change who he was. Yeah. And I'm like, why would they have to do that? You know, that, that doesn't make any sense. If they're both crazy, why would one of them have to change the, to maintain some kind of integrity in the, in the mess? They're, you know, they're messed up anyway. What you know, it didn't make any sense to me. So there was no way to check it out. You know, there's no way to see. Eight years later, I was uh, after a, after um, I finished my master's degree, I was on the second floor of a psych unit that I was assigned to. And here was this new patient walking around, talking to his voices. And, you know, they said the, the voices are hallucinations. So I was expecting them to be like, word word salad you you yeah. wouldn't be able to understand anything that they were saying it would just be like crazy stuff you know it wasn't like that and i saw one after another after another they went they were carrying on coherent conversations with something that i couldn't see and they were arguing with that whatever it was now it looked like they were talking to themselves but why would so many psychotic patients be talking to themselves you know, you might expect one or two of them. No, no, they were they were carrying on coherent conversations. And it was like you're listening to one side of a telephone conversation. You could hear the person talking, but you couldn't hear who was talking back. Yeah. And and they were sometimes they were very animated. Sometimes they broke out into arguments, you know, and screaming contests. It's like, oh, yeah, you're no good. At it. You know, and it, it just looked crazy if, you know, it, it didn't make any sense. Uh, especially believing from what they said in the textbooks that, you know, this is hallucinations and, and that's all they say. They don't tell you what the voices say because they treat them as hallucinations. It's like who would study a hallucination? You know, mm. you know and that's what they te teach in, uh, uh, in all, all the way through, all the way, you know, undergraduate, graduate uh, medical schools. The, the medical system had been taken over in 1910 here in the United States by Rockefeller and the Carnegie Foundation. So they sponsored this this law that they I'm sure they paid off Congress or they they had these uh, what do they call them canvassers or something that go in there and, and you know they went in there and they got Congress to pass this law about mental health with the, they called it the Flexner report 
it mm. shut down any medical school teaching subjects outside of mainstream pharmacology. So anything to taught kinesiology, naturopathy, mace, anything else, acupuncture, they couldn't graduate doctors. You know, it was only the people who were teaching pharmacology. That was done by big pharma. They took over the medical system in 1910 here in the United States. And I think all these other nations followed suit. Mm -hmm. The edict was so powerful that only a few medical schools survived, like as John Hopkins and McGill and a few others connected with these groups. You know, so here they were, you know, telling all these universities, your medical schools can't legally graduate doctors unless you teach this curriculum based on pharmacology. You know, nobody knew that. You know, they they did it very quietly. So there was only a few schools that survived. Doctors who practice anything beside pharmacology had their license threatened. You know, they they couldn't send anybody to a uh, naturopathy or or a Chinese uh, acupuncture or anybody. They they were threatened. Yeah. You know? So they took over the medical system at that point, and it, it they had to teach pharmacology. So I think the the Rockefellers or those guys they they uh, they had aspirin and and they wanted all these other drugs that that they had they so so the medical schools would be teaching pharmacology and along with that they're they're teaching uh, that the voices are hallucinations you know that's what we're being taught in school and they haven't done a single study on that anywhere you know and when I got to the state hospital. Here's this, this hospital as big as a small city, and everybody believed that the voices were hallucinations. And nobody was curious about what they were telling these patients. Oh, it's just nonsense. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're just hallucinating. It's garbage. Nobody understands what it is or why it's happening, you know, except that they blame it on a, a biochemical imbalance. Yeah. So what I saw happening was working closely with psychiatrists, and I, I didn't trust them either. I, you know, I didn't talk to them about anything I was finding. But what I did see is they didn't give a single test. So uh, you would ask them, what, what, what causes schizophrenia? Oh, it's a biochemical imbalance in their brain. And I go, well, well how, how do you know what's out of balance or by how much? I never see you guys give any tests. So you don't do any yeah. lab work. You don't give any tests. You don't... How do you know what's out of balance or by how much if you're not given tests? Oh, the, uh, the, the, the pharma companies tell us. They give us all these graphs and say these drugs are did it, uh, they balance this, this stuff. I said, you got to be kidding. You know, that, I'm thinking like that's, that's letting the fox in the hen house. What, what are you people thinking? You know? so, so they would just look at behaviors, and, like certain behaviors, and therefore that behavior would indicate this imbalance. Right. So the, and and then, then they'd go, there wasn't any any test to give for whatever. All these all these diagnoses were made up. They're all there's not a single test for a single one of those diagnoses in the DSM. You know, that started off with I think 91. Now it's up to 297, increasing every year. So they make these things up in these these. Uh, forums they have once every few years where a bunch of psychiatrists get together and I heard it described as a uh, like a tobacco barn where the guy comes in he goes hey I got a new psychiatric illness and it's this is the symptoms and da, 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 and this is da, 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 da. and you know the, the two-thirds of the, the psychiatrists in that meeting are connected with the big pharma you know so they go well which one of these can we make money off of you know what what, what kind of drug can we formulate maybe to treat this thing? So it, it's all a big scam. You know, that the, the, the DSM is, is, is just a joke. It's like, I, I think mm. I got something about it here. Yeah, here it is. It says uh, one of the biggest frauds perpetuated on the public by the psychiatric mafia and their puppet masters is the DSM mm. or the Diagnostic or Statistical Manual of Mental Illness. It's a, it, they treat it like a Bible in, in psychology and in, in, the, in the PhD program. It was like their Bible. It was like these things really exist. And they make you memorize large sections of it and spit it back mm. on a test. It's all fabricated. There's not a single test 
for any of those things. They took segments of behavior and they've made them into a pathology. And then they put all these impressive looking numbers, you know, schizophrenia, three, 3.414, you know, subsection, da, 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 and it goes on and on. And they use all this fight psychobabble and it looks very impressive. It looks like what they they know what they're talking about. They have no idea what they're talking about. They don't know what it is, what causes it. All they know is to drug the body, you know, and, and none of these illnesses are are physical. They, these are energetic mental illnesses. They don't belong well, in the in the physical universe. None of these drugs that they give to these people cure anything. It just tamps down behavior. It just it just with schizophrenics, it's a their major tranquilizers. They just knock them down until they can't see straight and they don't cause any trouble. You know, that was a big boon for them when when these phenothiazines came out. They were discovered by accident in a German dye lab, right? you know, that made closed dyes. And then the French took them and fabricated. And then they were using them for anesthetics and all this other stuff. They didn't. And then, uh, you know, some of the psychiatrists, I guess, they got the idea. Well, let's, you know, if it if it dumbs down people, let's give it to the, the schizophrenics, the psychotics. And, and see if it works. They wouldn't let them do that in Europe because it was taken over by the Freudians at that time. So they came over to the U.S. and they found they could dumb, dumb down entire populations of, you know, mental people in the, in the, in the hospitals. And then they were no trouble anymore. So they could reduce their staff, cost them a lot less money. They could keep these people doped up and, and manage them a lot easier. You know, they didn't have to fight them into straitjackets anymore. So it was mm. like a miracle drug for them. And psychology and neurology were battling it out for dominance in, in this field. And psychology, psychiatry was losing badly because they had nothing that worked, nothing. You know, they didn't need, they, not even psychoanalysis. So when they saw this phenothiazines come out, they jumped on that with both feet and they just took it over. It's like, oh, yeah, now... Now we got something that, that works. I mean, we prove we can drug these guys down and they don't cause trouble anymore, you know? So it was nuts. So, you know, right now the DSM contains, uh, I think it's 297 of these fabricated mental illnesses that they dreamed up by this small group of uh, psychiatrists. psychiatrists. So there was one psychiatrist, a Julian Whitaker. He said every single one of these mental illnesses were fabricated by breaking up segments of human behavior and pathologizing them. There are no blood tests. There are no lab tests. There's no x-rays. There's no EEGs to validate a single one of those diagnoses in this DSM manual that they treat like a Bible. They're just classes of behavior that are grouped together by psychiatrists who have voted them to be a mental disorder. So they vote them in and they vote them out. You know, um, I think so they had in... It's incredible. I mean, and I think most people that you talk to would say if you started talking about mental illnesses of all sorts of descriptions they would say oh well they would think it's a chemical imbalance in the brain or in the body well, they, 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 they would yeah they think it's a, a real mental illness and a, and a chemical imbalance and even though that's been conclusively disproven both the genetic theory and the biochemical theory i mean both of them solidly disproven they're still, the right. drug companies are still putting out advertisements going, it is believed that, or some studies showed that, you know, this is due to a chemical imbalance in the brain. Mm. Um, and for you, nothing, like, there's nothing to it. What do you, what do you feel from your time with, within these places and, and this work? Like, do you feel that it's more cause towards trauma or the experiences of, that the people have had? Yeah, I, th I, I think there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between intense physical, psychological, sexual, and, and physical abuse and, yeah. and methamphetamine. Methamphetamine, I, I saw that in the prison. You know, these, these prisoners who were using meth, I mean, it just opened them up to these things, just like opened the door and said, come on in. And the way it would manifest was uh, it, they'd first start hearing voices while they were high. Right. And then they'd go, oh, I'm just hallucinating. Then they'd come down and the voice would be gone. And that might go on for weeks or months. And, and you know, they come down and the, the voices are gone. Then one day, after maybe two months of them going away, once they come down, they don't go away. 
and they're there permanently. They're there to stay. They're just as psychotic as anybody on this on this on this on the wards, on the psych wards. Mm. You know, now they're done. I mean, you know, so none of these none of these diagnoses that they have, none of these two hundred ninety seven diagnoses, they they don't have any cures for any of them. All they do is give meds. So they're descriptions of behavior, and some of them are absolutely ridiculous. One of them is mathematics disorder that's in there now. <laughs> I, I have that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I, I, I don't get on with mathematics very well at all. I don't either. So, so I, I don't know what that's all about. Uh, I'm, if it's if it's accusing you of not getting along with mathematics, I got it too. <laughs> you know, so caffeine intoxication disorder is another one. You drink too much I, coffee, man. Yeah, yeah, you're I'm, getting jittery from coffee. That's a disorder. That's a psychiatric disorder. Now we put it in the DSM. You're a sicko. Yeah, we can treat <laughs> it. We, we got drugs to treat too. it. <laughs> yeah, we got drugs to treat it. Come see us. You know, wow. sibling relational disorder. These are kids fighting with one another. Now it's a disorder. Yeah, you know? and it gets wilder from there. You know, they they have the sexual orientation disturbance. I think that was in the DSM too. That was uh, homosexuality. You know, all these all these gays going crazy right now would love that one. Oh, the, the Flor Florence syndrome. Okay, this is being overwhelmed by the beauty, such as in Florence, Italy. And it's it's uh its symptoms are fainting and dizziness and it's treated with <laughs> antidepressants. This is the kind of clowns you're dealing with here. Wow. Pa Paris syndrome mostly affects Japanese people visiting France for the first time. <laughs> symptoms include depression, anxiety, and feelings of persecution. You know, back in, in my day when I was growing up, they'd call that cultural shock. You know, now it's a psychiatric disorder, the syndrome. That's you know? incredible. Something that you would imagine that you would experience in a new country. Or I love that they particularly pick a certain racial, you know, pocket of people for that one. That's 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 fascinating. It's incredible. It's nuts what they're doing, and they treat this. You know, they treat this DSM like the Bible. You know, they teach it in schools. It's it's they refer to it in medical schools. The, the insurance companies only pay for certain diagnoses. They use it mm -hmm. to charge people. You have 3029.90, you know, da, 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 da. and there's all these. It looks impressive. It looks like they know what they're talking about. They don't. Mm -hmm. You know, you look and they're charging a lot of money for this thing, too, you know, because everybody's got to use it. That's it's like a, a psychiatric lingo, mm -hmm. you know, but how they speak to one another with this stuff. But you, you put, you know. 10 psychiatrists in a room and you give them a, a semi-complex diagnosis, you're going to get 10 different diagnoses because yeah. it's all subjective. It's, it's what yeah. they feel. It's what they think. It's, it's their, their thing of control. There's uh there was an organization called the diagnostic um, network against psychiatric assault. It said the new diagnostic Bible of psychiatry, the DSM five, labels almost all human emotion as mental illnesses. A child who talks back, a man who spends too much time on the internet, a woman who grieves the death of her husband or child for more than two weeks are all labeled as mentally ill and told they need to be drugged. Unhappiness is labeled as depression. People are encouraged to numb themselves with drugs instead of dealing with life situations that are causing unhappiness. Over two thirds of psychiatrists who wrote the DSM-5 have financial ties to the drug industry. So that's what you're dealing with here. I mean, and it, it, that's an impressive looking book. I mean, you look at it and here's all this psychobabble in there and all these categories and, and fancy looking stuff. It's all a crop of crap. Quite intimidating for the average person. Who think, oh, oh, yeah, well, yeah. You know, that type and, of thing, and then, obviously. And then they put the labels on these things like I'm a yeah. schizophrenic. Yeah, well, what's that mean? That's strange. You know, you're a schizo. Well, that's not good, whatever it is, you know, or, you know, I'm a neurotic or, uh, you know, I'm uh, chronically depressed, uh, you know, or uh, uh, any one of those diagnoses. It, it's like it labels the whole person, mm. that thing. It, it's, it's a very destructive mechanism. I think that might be one of the one 
well, one of the positive aspects of uh, the work that I do and the fact that obviously I'm not qualified to treat diet nose or, or look at people in, in terms of their um, diagnosed issue that they come in with. And, and people come in with diagnosed issues. Though we just look, we tend to look beyond that and look at, well, um, what's the cause like underneath all that? Right. What is the cause? Yeah. We're, not, we're not allowed to look at the actual diagnosis, which is great because it actually has us look away from the diagnosis, which is that just a labeling really. And, and often I'm imagining that people, if you've been given a label, then often what that happens is reinforces some type of identity that they, that they're creating about that and yeah. to yeah. make it worse. So, um, the beauty is that people come in, they might have this shopping list of, you know, issues that they've been diagnosed with and then we say, okay, well, we, we don't treat diagnosis or look at those things. Let's have a look underneath all of that. Let's see what happened. And let's see what happened. Somewhere, some, some, somewhere along the line, something has happened and um, the minds or, or the, the, the body or the, the spirit or the person, is, their, their brain's taken a snapshot of something. And yeah, often um, trauma. That's it. And then the, the system, you know, says, okay, well, how do I protect myself from that ever happening again? Therefore, I'm going to start up certain types of, you know, almost we call them almost like biological programs that the body will start to enact and do when um, something is a threat or a, a perceived threat is continuing uh, within the system. And we just, we look for that perceived threat in the system. And often once the body has been, you know, reminded, you know what, you can come out of fight, flight, you can come out of threat, it's okay. That situation has passed. It's yeah. in the past. It's no longer present. And um, people walk out feeling so so different. And we haven't really talked, we haven't talked about their diagnosis or their label once. We, we look at more the metaphysical. So if you questioned, so a lot of your work and your, something like I'm assuming a lot of your passion was with people who were, hearing voices or becoming really interested in people who are hearing voices. And then, yeah, so what yeah, would happen it, it, inside, yeah, in the system if you questioned what the voices were? Oh, that, that, that happened to me twice. And I ended up in the psychiatrist's office both times being told, you will not ask the, these questions to, to these patients. What you're doing is um, reinforcing their hallucinations and you're making them worse. That's what they told me. Yeah. You know, and by then it was too late because I already saw they were starting to run patterns. You know, yeah. once I saw that, I said, they're not hallucination. But you can't tell these clowns that, you know, they're they're brainwashed coming out of these medical schools. You, you don't ask questions. I saw that in the Ph.D. program. They didn't like you asking too many questions. So I'd already by, by the time I got in, and this was supposed to be one of the best in the United States. And, I, I, you know, I was horrified at what I saw. And uh you, you, I'd already spent seven years on the front lines, the very worst front lines. I mean, this was like the Western Front, you know, Central State Hospital. I mean, everything was there, you know, and I was exposed to all this. I get back into the PhD program and here they start teaching this nonsense again. And it, it's like it had nothing to do clinically with how to help these people. You know, it was all these theories and, and stuff. And and you ask them too many questions and they start getting really pissed off. They don't like that. Yeah. You know, do what we say, you know, or you don't get a degree. That's all there is to it. You know, you know, they, <clears throat> if had I been working in the system and doing what I'm doing now, they would have taken my license and, and probably just threw me, threw me out of the side of the road. That's why I dropped it. You know, yeah. they have no license to take now. They don't yeah. understand what I'm doing at all because I'm working in the energetic universe now. You know, they, uh, well, it's the same place John Mace does. And, and I understand what the voices are, I understand how they operate, I understand what they're doing. And I can teach these people that. You know, I understand yeah. the patterns they run. Uh, and and people can do a lot on their own if they if they understand what these things are and how they operate. But they're not, psychiatry is never going to tell them that because they don't know themselves. They haven't done yeah. one single research paper on, on any of the voices. They're, they're just mm. hallucinations because they say so. Yeah. By all the power invested in them with these fancy diplomas they get 
through their brainwashing. It's like, well, they're hallucinations. I was taught they were hallucinations. So here's this whole hospital when I got there. All of them believing these things were hallucinations. You know, yeah. None of them asking any questions or even being the least bit curious about what these voices were telling patients. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's a key word, the curiosity. And I, I remember a story that you I'd love if you'd tell the story when you you got curious when you you saw one of the patients, a new patient that came that came in and you noticed he was talking to himself and you sort of watching him and he noticed you watching him and you went up and approached him and actually um tried a little technique on him to see if some of the you know, the teaching that you've been giving over the years was true about how they, what's happening within that interaction. Do you know the conversation I'm talking about, Jerry? The one where the guy said, oh, I'm Jesus? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that story. Do you mind yeah, telling I, that story? I, I think I did. Didn't I tell it earlier or no? Uh, yeah, the, the guy on just, the second floor of the psych unit? Uh, not not when we were recording. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. The, the wonder. Yeah. I, I, I wonder if I was starting to lose my mind there. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so so what what happened there is in in undergraduate school, and I think I, what I was saying is that they would they expect you to take everything they taught at face value. You had no way to check it out, you know. And I wasn't very trusting of of uh, authority figures at that point in my life. I mean, I had a lot of bad experience with authority figures and uh, a lot of betrayal by them. So I didn't trust them. And here here was this whole four-year program where they were expecting you to just take all this stuff in and just regurgit regurgitate it out. You know, And there was no way to verify it. Uh, like I said, other than experimental psychology in the rat labs where you go in there and you have, uh, you, you run these different uh, scenarios and you watch the, la the rat do exactly what they predicted it would do. You know, you could you could see that, so that was very useful. You know, that was that was one of the most useful things they taught in undergraduate school was behavior modification stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, all this other stuff, I mean, you look in the back of the books of these these big textbooks with all this stuff in it, and it's this guy got the, this information from this guy who got it from this guy who got it from that guy, and and all the way down the line, it's like if they all agree on whatever this thing was that they originally got it from, it becomes a reality. You know, so I'm like, what's that? It reminded me of these little fish when I was scuba diving. I burned up a whole tank of air watching these little guys. You know, they 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 had these little pebble mounds and they would stick their head out of these pebble mounds and they would steal these rocks from one another. So when one went to steal a rock from somebody else, somebody would come and steal his rock. You know, so this whole community was stealing rocks from one another. It was like this little incest rock community. And the only place where new rocks were coming in were from the, the weirdos on the outside. You know, they were going out into the world and getting new rocks and bringing them into the system. And the rest of them were just passing them among themselves. And I didn't know why that, that fascinated me at the time. But after thinking about what psychologists do, you know, there, there they were. Yeah, there they were. That was them. <laughs> And you know, later I found out this big research organization did a study. They kept saying in, in graduate school, it's like publish or perish, publish or perish. And they were publishing all kinds of junk. You know, it didn't matter as long as they could get it in print, you know, make the university and the and the department look good. And uh this this big research uh entity did this uh study on material published by psychologists. And they replicated their experiments. 80% failed. They could not replicate the results. So that means 80% of what they were publishing and putting into print and putting in the journals was all bull crap. You know? and, and I could see that. You know, it was like, mm. uh, you know, the, 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 so when I started seeing, well, I, you, I was back into talking about this one guy. OK, so um, and with this distrust, uh, I was on the second floor of the psych unit that day doing rounds. And I saw this this new guy um, that, you know, I hadn't seen before. And he here he is carrying on a conversation with somebody I couldn't see. It sounded like a telephone conversation. You could hear his part talking to whoever or whatever it was. 
but you couldn't hear the response. And there wasn't anybody there and he didn't have a telephone. But his part of the conversation was completely logical and made sense. You know, it wasn't it wasn't babble. So I tried to creep up on him to see, uh, well, well, what is he talking about? You know, who's he talking to? And he caught me. So he turns around and I introduced him. I said, um, I'm Jerry. I'm the psych for this unit. I haven't seen you here before. Uh, what's your name? And he looks up at me. He goes, I'm Jesus Christ. And I think back and I go, OK, no, you can't be Jesus Christ because I am. And I'm, I'm like, okay, what's he going to do? You know, I'm thinking, and what's he going to do? And he cocks his head up and he's thinking a little bit. And, you know, he goes, and he looks at me, he goes, okay, we can both be Jesus Christ. And then he just walks off. So I said, okay, what else did they lie to me about? You know, what else in, in this in this garbage did they lie to me about? And this, the second one was that biochemical imbalance thing, you know, where I saw the psychiatrist not giving any tests. You know, and I watched them. They gave no test whatsoever. It, it was like they, they would listen to what the guy said. They go, well, it seems like this. You know, they go to the DSM and they, they didn't even use the DSM. They just, it didn't matter. Whatever they put down was a thing, you know, no matter how imprecise it was. And then they'd prescribe the drugs for it. Something they'd go down and they, and if it didn't work, they bring the guy in the next week. How's it working? Well, no, it's it's not working at all. It's it's it really stinks. What you? Well, let's try something else. And that, that's what they did. They just tried over and over and over again, until they ran out. And then they would just pick the one that worked the best. Mm. You know, and and uh, you know they they it it's it's nuts what they're doing. You know, so you know, now now you you turn on the TV and you and you got you know these. The drug commercial after drug commercial after drug commercial, you know, it's it's crazy. And you you look at what they're doing. I mean the the God here the let me see I got some statistics here somewhere. Mm -hmm. You you look at the money they're making for for any antipsychotic drug market. This antidepressants. This is antidepressants. Expected mm -hmm. to hit fifteen point nine eight, almost sixteen billion dollars by two thousand twenty three. Wow! You know, and I, I think some of those antidepressants have uh, um, warnings on them, saying could trigger suicidal ideation. Because there's a number of people who, after taking those, actually killed themselves. Yeah. So the global antipsychotic drug sales. This is some of the most dangerous drugs used in medicine. In uh, in 2021, it was $14.54 billion. It's expected to reach uh, $15.5 15, 15 billion in 2022. Mm -hmm. So you talk about why they don't want you know, the system to change. They don't want anything that works. They're making a, a, a ton of money. You know? and, and look yeah. what they're doing to kids. I mean... Give me a second. My baby bulldog at the door. In the United States, more than 7.2 million kids are on some kind of psychiatric drug. They're drugging down the entire population. Look at they're making billions of dollars drugging people down. You know, they're mm. drugging down the entire population. And you turn on the TV and it's like, take this drug, take that drug, take this drug, 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 drug. And, and psychiatry is just drug, 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 drug. They're, they're drug pushers. You know, now they're moving in the kids. Seven and a half, uh, seven point two million kids on psychiatric drugs. Uh, as of two thousand seventeen, over a million kids in the United States under the age of six were on psychiatric drugs. Wow! Over over six hundred and twenty-two thousand were under the age of five. Over eighty thousand were on amphetamines for ADHD. You know, and I ran into a bunch of prisoners in prison that started out like that. They were prescribed Ritalin and Adderall for ADHD, and they moved up to the, the street amp meth because it gave them a, a bigger high. Yeah. You know, and I, I would ask them, I said, well, you were feeling good with the small doses they were giving. Why would you keep pushing it? And they go, oh, I don't know. It just felt better. You know, now they're meth addicts. You know? Yeah. Um, over over almost 190,000 kids in the U.S. are on anti-anxiety drugs. 
Mm. You know, they're drugging the entire population. Over 38,000 are on antipsychotic drugs. And these are the drugs that cause brain damage. They, they rot out your peripheral nervous system. They rot out your, your central nervous system. Um, you know, it, it's nuts. And, and you look at, you look at the, the entire population. I mean, you look, you know, in the, in the United States, almost 50,000 Americans kill themselves every year. Now, we're, we're, you're looking at a population that has more psychiatric drugs available than on any other time in history on this planet. You know, almost 50,000 Americans are killing themselves every year. You know, 50,000 died in the 10-year Vietnam War. And this is happening year after year after year after year. You don't hear about it. They don't publish that stuff. It doesn't hit the mainstream media. It doesn't hit the magazines. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's like... It, this this mental Western mental health system is is just a it's a drug fueled merry go round. Nobody's getting better. With each revolution, it 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 sucks thousands of dollars out of the healthcare system. You know, and these these uh, side effects of these antipsychotic drugs are horrible. Nobody wants to stay on those. You know, yeah. <clears throat> so they quit. They go psychotic. They're brought back into the hospital. They stay until their insurance runs out. Then they kick them out, they fill them full of drugs again, and put them back onto the streets. A few weeks later, it happens again, and then they come again. It goes round and round and round and round. And nothing's being cured, nothing, with any of those drugs. Mm. Yeah, and you you would think if the system to a degree was working, you'd think of all that medication with all that science and all that time. We've had to trial things and test things and see whether it's actually making a difference to people you'd think by now that we'd you know we'd be getting somewhere and you wouldn't be seeing those types of statistics around people um killing themselves and even in my own clinic um in, particularly in the last two or three years which is not surprising with what we've been through the amount of anxiety like anxiety depression um and uh, you know sort of people being traumatized by their mind um, or feeling down or feeling all sorts of things around that area is just complete. It's quadruple. And, and, yeah. And all that's energetic stuff. I mean, thoughts are energy, you know, you know mm. feelings are energy. Intuition is energy. The, it's all energy. And, and these, these drugs are just drugging down the body. They're not getting at the cause of anything, nothing, mm. you know, and they're making billions of dollars doing this and they've, brainwash the population into believing that these things actually work and that that's the only treatment there is you know yeah. forget everything else i mean it, it's it's bad the cdc reports here that uh 132 people in the u.s kill themselves every day every day day after day after day here in the u.s suicide is the 11th leading cause of death you know and it's increasing it's increasing between 2000 and 2018 Suicide rates increased 37%. You know, 24 veterans are killing themselves every day. Mm. You know? And then the suicide rate's increasing by like 2% a year. I mean, this system is not working. No. It's it's clear it's not working. It's a drug-fueled merry-go-round. It's not doing anything for these people. Yeah. So your early time in the the more sort of like mental institutions, like it was pretty challenging to to question or, or research or study. Or you're starting to see patterns emerge. You're starting to see things and think, hang on a minute, something's not quite right. There's something else going on here. Yes, so when, that's when exactly something else. And it's just through your own eyes what you're witnessing, what you're seeing, patterns of people. Um, not like it was you went in there with a preconceived idea of how how you no. thought things were. Well, I thought I thought they were hallucinations. I would, like everybody else, I walked in there like I was told they were hallucinations. I was told mm. that they taught that they were chemical imbalance. But then when mm. I actually saw what was going on, I said, "Wait a minute, this doesn't jive with what the university taught me. You know, mm. This doesn't this doesn't jive at all. There's hey wait, there's something bad wrong here." Mm -hmm. So I started asking the patients themselves, you know, yeah. what, what are these voices telling you? And, and these patterns started to emerge. The first two patterns was negativity. You know, mm -hmm. The voices were consistently persistent, negative. They weren't, they weren't uh, you know, hallucinations are all over the place. They're positive, negative, they're neutral. They're just all over the map. No, 
these voices were consistently negative. You're no mm -hmm. good. You're rotten. You're ugly. You're stupid. Uh, nobody likes you. You're you're a failure. You're you you you, uh, you you can't trust anybody. I mean, consistently negative. And so it's like, what is holding them on that negative pattern? How come they aren't random like hallucinations? Something mm -hmm. is holding them to that pattern. You know, it reminded me of this uh, movie, The uh, Enemy Below, where in World War II, uh, a, a destroyer was chasing a Nazi U-boat. And every time it would catch it, it would depth charge it, and then it would escape, and, and then it would return to the certain course again. So when when the destroyer lost it, it just went to that course, and it would find that U-boat again. You know, this is a this is a programmed course. I mean, there's something holding these hallucinations on that course, and that was the first one I saw. The mm -hmm. second one I saw where they were anti-religious. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the chaplain would hold uh, these prayer meetings and, you know, singing and he'd, he'd bring in cake and ice cream, which was hard to get on the, on the, in the state hospital. Mm -hmm. So what I noticed is that all the patients went down except the schizophrenics. They stayed in their bed on the dingy ward, staring up at the ceiling. And after seeing that a few times, I'm like, well, well that's curious. Though. All this, none of the schizophrenics are going to these things where there's ice cream and music and dancing. And uh, so I started asking them, what's going on? How come you're not down there with the rest of the guys? Oh, there, there is no God. I don't read the Bible. I don't like preachers. Uh, and you'd look on their bedstand, and here's all this horrible stuff they were reading, you know, murder mysteries and, and war stories. And it was all negative stuff. So I noticed that. There was a pattern to it. And... Uh, um, then one day, um, one patient came in and said, uh, well, I, I, the, when the voices came, I prayed the 23rd Psalm. And he said they reacted like worms thrown on a hot frying pan. You know, they went nuts. They couldn't stand it. And I'm like, why would a hallucination do that? Yeah. Mm. So, it's, you know, I had no, no lack of schizophrenics there. I mean, there were, there were plenty, you know. And on top of that, I'd never seen in my entire career. All the different places I worked, all the different facilities, I never saw a single researcher anywhere on the front lines. They were not to be found. They would not let them in. You know, you can't get a, uh, you can't go to a psych hospital and say, hey, I want to study this. Or they, they won't let you in. They say, oh, well, we're not going to take the risk. You might get hurt. You know, uh, you can't go into a mental health center. Oh, no, uh, you, you got, we got confidentially stuff that we've got to worry about. Da, da, da. They won't let you in. They, there's no researchers on the front line. None of them. They never let, they, they wouldn't let them in. Mm. You know? So nobody was doing research on the front lines. Uh, so I started, I started wondering about this stuff. They would go off their psych meds. And every time they did, I'm like, well, why are they doing that? They know they're going to go nuts. It doesn't look like they're having fun when they're nuts, you know, when they're crazy. It looks horrible. They're, they're, they're paranoid. They're seeing monsters. They're seeing ghosts. They're they're hearing voices threatening them. They're they're seeing demons come out of the walls. I mean, it's hard. It's like the worst nightmare you could ever imagine. Yeah. So I'm like, you know, well, okay, the the side effects are awful, but they're not like that. You know, so I'm like, why are they doing that? Why are they going off these drugs when they know what's going to happen? Because they've done it over and over and over again. So uh, I'd call them in. You know, and I'd, I'd say, uh, I started doing a little research on it. I'd say, well, what side effects did you actually have, you know, when you were taking your, your antipsychotic drugs? And they'd list a handful, you know, the common ones. Uh, they they all didn't have the same side effects, so I just had them list them. And it was like, you know, well, sexual dysfunction, uh, grogginess, uh, blurred vision, uh, uh you know, I can't think straight. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not myself. I'm not functioning right. That that kind of stuff. And then <clears throat> after I got that, I had the whole list from the DSM of all the psychiatric, you know, things that happened to them. You know, the hallucinations and the, and all the bad stuff when they're in a floridly psychotic state. And yeah. plus, I added a few of my own, and I gave them both back. And I said, which one's worst? Every single one of them said the psychotic state was worst. And then I'd ask them, well, then why'd you stop taking your drugs? I mean, you see, this the, the, being crazy is, is much worse than, than these side effects. So why'd you stop taking your drugs? Yeah. What do you think they said? 
the voices told them to go off uh, of? Well, no, what they said is, I don't know. Ah. Uh, you know, in a lot of cases, the voices would the voices would tell them that, but I didn't know that at the time. Well, you know, they, they just said, I don't know. That went on for three years. I felt like an, a, a nutcase myself because I kept asking them, why do you do this? Why? You know, yeah. and I got the same answer. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You know, and three years. And then finally, toward the end of the seven years I spent there, there was this uh, one girl who she was doing great in school. You know, mm -hmm. she she was hearing voices. She was taking her bed. She was she was visiting, uh, fi finishing cosmetology school. She was about to get her license. She went off the voice the the medicines for the third time. And back mm -hmm. then, that's all that's all we had. We didn't know anything about anything else. It was like that that was it. You, they're just the only way you treat schizophrenia is with with medicines. That's it. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody was doing anything different. Counseling that was like shooting a rhino in the butt with a BB rifle. It, 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 you're wasting your time you know so uh the mother was notified that we we're going to discharge her from the program and the mother called me desperate and said uh oh, please don't do that i can't handle her i've been through this before I'm, i'll come up there and we'll talk to her we'll find out why she didn't go on her meds and you know g g give me give me a chance I'll, I'll i'll come up and i said okay come on up this friday she showed up on friday and uh we were talking and i told I told the patient, I told the girl that uh, her mother was coming up and uh, we brought them together. And the mother and I are both asking this patient, why did you do that? You knew you were going to be kicked out if you did it another time. You mm -hmm. knew you were going to be discharged. You were already warned. You'd done it two times previous. This is your third strike. You're out. Why'd you do this? She said, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. And I said, try me. I've, I've heard some really weird stuff since I've been living mm -hmm. here, you know, working here which I actually was living there on the, they had psych, uh, uh, staff dorms there because it was in the middle of nowhere. So I was actually living on the grounds of this major hospital. And uh, she said, uh, the voices told me that psychiatry was poisoning me. And they pointed to the side effects of the meds. So actually she was being poisoned by those meds. They were toxic. And the voices told her, look, he's poisoning you. Look at look at what's happening. When you take these drugs, look at all this stuff that happens to you. He's, he's poisoning you. Now, when I first got there, the psychiatrists were always getting beat up. You know, they were get, getting attacked by patients. And it turned out they were psychotic patients. They were schizophrenics more than any other doctor. You know, wow. more than general practitioners, more than psychiatric nurses, more than psychologists, more than counselors, more than teachers hands down they were getting the, they were getting their clocks clicked more than any other staff member except maybe for for um, attendants who were on those wards with these patients 24 hours a day so it didn't make sense to me why that was happening because they were spending less time with them than any other mm -hmm. staff member you know what are they saying to these guys in 20 minutes where they're getting the, mm -hmm. the, the you know their clocks clocked you know, and it, it didn't make any sense but when she told me that it all clicked in yeah, yeah, they're hit. They're beating those psychiatrists because they're giving them these meds, and the voices don't like those meds because it calms the patient down. That's the only reason they work; they calm them down. Right. You know, there is no biochemical imbalance. There is no genetic thing. But look what they did. You know, they, they the, first they blame mothers for it. You know, back in the fifties, it's a mother's fault. The mother did something. And it, it, she, it's her fault. The mothers went, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait a minute. We, we didn't do anything. You know, I, I was a good mother. I did the best I could. You know, you could see that. So they moved it up into a province that couldn't be seen. Genetics. It's a genetic defect. You know, so here's the drug companies going, yeah, it's genetic. There's nothing you can do about it except take our drugs. You know, but that went, they got away with that for another decade or so. And, and, and then some geneticists said, listen, we studied this for years. We don't see any genetic abnormality with schizophrenics. It's just not there. You know, they published that stuff. I don't know how they got it in the journals past the big pharma, but they did. Mm -hmm. So that went out, you know, but the, still they're preaching. I, I pulled up a thing this morning and here they're still saying on. Uh, uh, what was it? I forgot what it was. It was uh, it was one of the search engines. I just I just punched in what's the cause of schizophrenia and biochemical imbalance came up again, even though it's been conclusively disproven. And Thank genetics you. came up again with it. So they're still advertising these things. They're total lies. 
you know. So once the genetic thing got knocked out, then uh, Eli Lilly, I believe it was in uh, in in the seventies when they came out with Prozac, see that they needed some cause. They needed something to to make it look like they knew what was happening, and they didn't. Yeah. They had they had no cause. They had no cure. So they had nothing except these yeah. drugs. And and patients were and families were experiencing that these drugs didn't work. They didn't do anything. They didn't stop the symptoms. They just drugged the people out. They just you know gorked them out. They were they turned them into zombies. You know, so they didn't cause a lot of trouble, but they weren't getting better, and, no. and they weren't anywhere like they used to be. You know, they weren't they weren't the same people they had been, and they, they're just kind of walking around like zombies. So they needed something else after genetics went out so eli Lilly said well you know we're producing these uh antidepressant drugs and it is having some effect so it must be bi biochemical and then they did all these studies and they go well we yeah, it's dopamine uh, you know dopamine it's a dod a dopamine reuptape something or other uh, you know, so they they put all these big words and did these fancy things and and got away with it for another decade you know and then um these other uh, biochemists come up and they go we don't find any chemical imbalance in the brains of schizophrenics we don't find anything different chemically so it was another fabrication that they, they used to pull out they they put it up where the people couldn't examine it mm -hmm. where the results were out of reach of virtually most of humanity mm -hmm. you know except most for a very small tell. Most people don't understand that they think, oh, the brain's complex. and Yeah, you know, yeah, it's too you know, complex. Yep, biochemistry yep. is very complex. Yeah, and... yeah, all this. And that's what they use. Oh, yeah, it's very complex. And studies say, you know, the studies mm. say. They don't say what studies. They don't say how they're mm. done. They just mm. say, the studies say this. You know, the studies indicate that. Yeah, they got the whole world brainwashed. They're totally yeah, I'd be brainwashed. To, this... Totally. I'd be really interested to um, to know what you think about moving i guess more away from the whole concept of genetics like even within our work like we've got lists we've got information that we test down against to see what the body uh responds to and it could be biochemical it could be whatever and because the more i'm learning and through people like yourself i start to wonder well is it really biochemistry what is it what is really going on um but often i'll have clients come in and the word genetics comes up but i I don't necessarily see it like, you know, oh, there's some genetic pattern happening. I look at it more so inside of that something can be passed energetically from one person in a generation to another. So I don't know yes. whether it, what, yeah. I think, so you're, I think you're absolutely right. You know, they say it's a genetic thing. But what I've seen is the parents, the, a, a schizophrenic parent will create the conditions in the child for these entities to move in and take over. Right. Right? So it's more that than it's genetics. You know, it's more, they, the epi, more the epigenetic, the environment within the person, that right, the person right. which will you trigger know, off certain things. Because if you're and... raised by a schizophrenic parent, yeah, you know, you're, you're going <laughs> to, chances are you're going to become a schizophrenic. You right. know, that's what you learn. That's how you learn to behave, you know, and, the, and these things just move in there. So they create the conditions for, yeah. for that to happen. You know? Absolutely. So you yeah. went from that sort of clinical environment then into prisons, right? So how well, different prisons, was that? Well, it, it, that was, it, for me, it was good for the, for the studying I was doing, for the, the research mm. I was doing, because the, the, in, in the state hospital, it was like a sin to do anything to upset schizophrenics because the schizophrenics mm. were beating up, you know, they were beating up uh, the, the attendants on the wards. Okay, mm -hmm. and they were beating up psychiatrists. So, mm -hmm. I think psychiatrists were afraid of them. Yeah, you know. So it's like, don't do anything to upset them. You never know what they're going to do. You know, they're unstable. Mm -hmm. They just pop off at nothing for no reason because they didn't understand why they were being attacked by these people. To them, it looked like a random attack. You mm -hmm. know, they didn't know what the voices were telling them. They they didn't know that that the, the, the voices were telling them that hey, he's he's poisoning you. It, to them, it appeared like a random attack out of nowhere. You know, they just yeah. up and attacked them. So they were afraid of these guys. The unwritten rule was you don't do anything to upset them that you don't have to. Yeah. So so if they found out I was questioning these guys and I was upsetting them by answering those questions, they didn't want any part of that. You know, they were already understaffed. They had caseloads of 700 people. 
and and they were they were overwhelmed. They were just drugging people here and there and there. And then there were three thousand shock treatments going on every year there, which destroyed brain cells in a massive manner. Didn't didn't really cure anybody. You know, it drove away the voices for a short period of time. I saw, but they came back. Uh, it helped alleviate depression for a short time, but it it didn't mm -hmm. really do any permanent cures from what I saw. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, seeing that they were lying about the uh, biochemical imbalance, what was the next thing, you know? But I was able to do much more research in the prisons because once I got there, I had a group of, of schizophrenics. I mean, they, they closed down all the state hospitals here, or virtually all of them. They, they have very low levels now. And they said, we're going to put them in a more normal environment. That'll be better for them. You know, they'll go to the mental health center on the, in the community and they'll get their meds. They couldn't get them to take those meds when they were in the psych wards handing them to them. What makes them mm. think that they were going to go through all the trouble of finding transportation to go to a mental health center 15 miles away to pick up these meds that they didn't want in the first place? It was a yeah. complete disaster. You know, they didn't go to get them and they ended up on the street. They ended up in jail because they couldn't hold jobs. They, they would break the law, they end up in jail. So they end up in prison where I was. Yeah. So when I left the state hospital, I was like, I can't figure these guys out. This makes no sense. It's driving me crazy. I want to get away from them for a while. So I didn't want to go back. I was, I've had my fill of them. What they're doing makes no sense. I see there's patterns, but what does that mean? You know, I see that those drugs doesn't work. What? But what's going on? I still don't know what's going on. You know, I knew the voices had something to do with it. And I was I was beginning to get information back about what they were telling these people. But it, it wasn't enough. I mean, I was like, what, it was like all these pieces of a puzzle floating around and only only clumps of them were starting to gel. Mm -hmm. And those clumps by themselves didn't make any sense. And I was like beating my head against a brick wall. Um and I was I was tired of them. I was like, okay, I'll get in back to into graduate school. Two years of that was worse than dealing with the schizophrenics. So when I got back, I, I came to Tucson and got a job at the state prison in the psychology department. Okay, there was a different story. You know, so they just wanted those guys handled. They didn't want them causing any trouble. You know, so you could count on a psychologist psychiatrist to drug them. So we were the psychologists were like paid snitches for psychiatry. If you see any trouble, if it looks like one of these diagnoses, call the psychiatrist and he'll drug these guys. You know, so they so the even the prisoners didn't trust these guys. So it took a while to to build their trust, but I I learned how to do that in the state hospital because every little piece you learn about what the voices are saying or how they act if you feed it to a new schizophrenic, they go, well, he understands something about it. He's trying to learn and they'll tell mm -hmm. you more. So it was mm -hmm. a years long process of like feeding them everything that I'd learned. I know this much. What else can you tell me? And I had to be careful at the state hospital because if I got caught again asking these guys questions, uh, they'd burn me, you know, or they could fire me. So in the prison, it wasn't that way. It's like, you know, you keep these guys down, keep them out of our hair. You can do whatever you want with them to start with. You know, just keep them yeah. out of our hair. Don't they, We don't want them causing problems. We don't want them going psychotic and beating anybody up. You know, to just, just keep them out of our hair. So that was easy enough to do. So what I did is I formed groups of and just specific prisoners who agreed to tell me in real time when we were in session what the voices were telling, you know. And that was really interesting, you know, so I could get to hear in real time their conversations with the voices and what the voices were saying back. So it was like now mm. I had the other side of the telephone. Yeah. You know, so they were telling me what they're saying to the voices. The voices were responding back and I was taking notes on all this. So I have all these conversations that they have. So now I had the other side of the telephone conversation and I was learning a lot more about the patterns that were emerging. Yeah. So by the time after I think I spent 17 or 18 years in the prison, by the time I got there, got done, I had a list of like 30 patterns that these things were running. Okay, And what I started experimenting with is after I saw that they were running patterns, it's like, OK, what do you do if you throw a monkey wrench in their patterns? What happens? You know, 
So I started throwing monkey wrenches in their patterns. Well, try this, try that. How'd this work? And, you know, I had all of them. I, took, I want you to try this over the next week and come back and tell me what happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. So <clears throat> if I got positive results, I'd change it. If I got negative results, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd adjust until I had, you know, better monkey wrenches to throw into the patterns. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, the, the prisoners started coming back and saying, the voices are pissed at you. They really are getting pissed with you. They don't like what you're doing. They didn't want me to come here. They're telling me to stay in bed and blow off my my appointments with you. And it wasn't just one. And they didn't know each other because they were coming from all different parts of the unit. Mm. And it was like, uh, and one after the other was saying that. The voices are really good. They don't like what you're doing. They, they, they're they really getting pissed with you. And then one guy, I remember, he came in <clears throat> and after after we were done, he turns in the doorway and he looks at me and he goes, you know what you're doing is dangerous, don't you? And I just looked at him and I I didn't ever thought about that. You know, it just mm -hmm. didn't cross my mind. I went, well, mm -hmm. they're stuck. You know, I'm going, they're stuck in your head, not mine. They can't come out. You know, they're, they're, they're with you. I don't have them. You know, so, so, but it stuck with me. That warning, it was like a warning, you know, and it was like an, an ominous warning. I didn't know what to make of it. But I didn't forget it. It was like that other guy who said, I'm Jesus Christ. I stuck it in the back of my mind and they go, well, I'll just, I'll just keep that for future reference. Mm -hmm. So I kept figuring out ways to, to throw monkey wrenches in these patterns. And these guys were getting better. The voices were getting less. They were getting less intense. They came less often as long as they would keep, keep it up. And it took a lot of work on their part. You know, and I, I only worked with ones who would actually do you know, throw the monkey wrenches in those patterns and come back and tell me what happened. If they wouldn't yeah. do that, I'd, you know, go back out in the general population and good luck, take the meds, you know. So these people were getting better and better the more monkey wrenches I threw into the patterns. And then one guy comes in one day and he says, uh, uh, the voices want to talk to you. That had never happened before in like 25, 30 years before. And that never happened. It was always the voices would talk through the patient and I would talk. So the patient was like the interpreter. You know, yeah. he was like the middleman. You know, I'd tell the voices this and he'd tell he'd tell what the voices said back. It was always there was always the middleman. I never thought about talking to them directly. And I didn't I don't know why at that point I didn't. And um, so one day he knocks on my door in, in my office. He didn't have a pass. I don't know how he got in there. Knocks on my door and he said, the voices want to talk to you. Mm. I'm like, they want to talk to me personally? He goes, yeah, they want to talk to you personally. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Come on in, sit down. They close the door. I sat down, I braced myself. So I said, what do they got to say? And I'll never forget it. These words came out of his mouth. You have no right to interfere with our way of life. And I'm like, boom. <laughs> it was like, wow. whoa. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, do, 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 do. It was like outer limits. It was like, do, 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 do. You know, my my denial system that was already in tatters. I mean, it was already, it was already junked. It was just barely standing up. At that point, it just collapsed. And I went, yeah. these are entities. These aren't, these aren't some figment of the subconscious mind. These are actual thinking communicating entities yeah uh, and it just blew me away i mean it was like i was stunned you know and it was like uh you know I, I closed my office that day and i just i didn't see anybody else i'm like what am i getting into i have no cognitive map i yeah. don't know where this is going you know it's like uh no i can't talk to anybody about it the only people who understood it were the schizophrenics <laughs> you know, it were the crazy people who understood what I was talking about. You couldn't talk to anybody who's considered sane about this stuff, you know, but I could, I could talk to all the schizophrenics about it. Well, the voices yeah. are doing this. Yeah. Yeah. I know they're doing that. Well, they said this to this guy and you know, yeah, they said that to me, you know, so we, we could talk about them. You know, but no, yeah. you couldn't, I couldn't mention it to any of the, any of the others, Not, nobody on the psych staff, nobody on the medical staff. I couldn't talk to anybody. Yeah. I couldn't Did talk to my afraid? wife. Not not yet where i started feeling afraid was um i was stunned with that when they came the voices are uh, they tell me you you have no right to interfere with our way of life i, I was shocked yeah but I, I wasn't afraid where i started getting afraid was that same guy i kept working with him i didn't stop 
you know, he was getting better and, and we kept going. Then one day he, he comes in and I was reading a book by Miguel Ruiz, who's a South American shaman. Mm -hmm. And he was talking, it's called the voice of knowledge. So he mm -hmm. was talking about these, these entities that suck energy from people. Now, I already knew that that happened when I was working at the state hospital. I noticed that there was a one-to-one -one correlation between the voices hitting these people and their energy levels dropping down to almost zero. You know, they were they were saying that, you know, even though they were just tossing and turning in bed all night, they'd get up in the morning. They say, I'm so drained. I felt like I was digging a hot ditch out in the hot sun all day. You know, they were just totally drained. And it, there was a one-to-one -one correspondence with that. Uh, and I'm like, well, what's with that? What's with that? And then I read this this thing by Miguel Ruiz saying, well, they're parasites. They're taking these people's energy. So I brought that book in to this guy whose voices said, you have no right to interfere with my way of life. I was always bringing stuff in there. So what do you think about this? What do you think about that? What do you, you know, what do you think about this? What this psych guy says? And I always, always asking him questions all the time. So I started reading that that paragraph where they were talking about um, <clears throat> these entities being um, parasites. As soon as I hit that part, this guy turned, he got this glazed look on his face. And I, I turned up to ask him, I said, well, well I was going to ask him, well, what do you think about that? And he, he just has this glazed look, like just this blank stare. And then I hear this crackle erupt from right behind my head sounded just like an arc welder you know that that loud it was loud it was like crack 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 and then i'm like what, what the hell's going on you know and I look around i don't see anything then it starts moving up the right wall on a 45 degree angle toward the corner of the back room and i'm looking i don't see anything i don't smell anything it's just this loud crack and i'm looking at him and he's just staring back at me with this bizarre look and i go he's going to attack so I push my chair against the wall so I could kick him back if he came at me. And I'm trying to keep an eye on him while I'm looking for whatever is this mm. crackling. So I'm going back and forth, back and forth. You know, da, 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 I didn't want to take my eyes off him for too long. I don't see anything. I don't smell anything. It's just crackling. It just went on and on and on. It goes up the right wall. It goes across the ceiling. So I could I could see him and where the noise was at the same time. I don't see anything. There's no light. There's no nothing. It's just a crackle comes down the right left hand wall and it jumps into this rubber made trash can right next to my leg and i bend over and i look in there and there's nothing there and then it just goes boom, it's done it's out it stops just like that and i'm like stunned I'm, I'm, this time really stunned i'm like what the hell just happened and i look at him and i, I say did you hear that and he doesn't say anything he just slowly gets up and he goes i gotta leave and he shuffles out of the room and I'm like, yeah, get out of here. Get the hell out of here. You know, go. Get, get, go. Keep going. Don't come back. <laughs> After he left, I started searching the room for burn marks or whatever else is. I don't see anything. So I go out in the hall and I'm, I check all the other offices. None of the doctors or nurses are in yet. I'm the only one in the medical center at that point, except for the guard up front. There's no there's no explanation for what happened. And it wasn't just like a few seconds. This went on for like 20 or 30 seconds. It was a long time. You know? And, I, and I, I'm like, there it goes again. You know, boom. And I'm like, if they can do that, if they can affect physical reality, what else can they do? You yeah. know, so now I'm starting to worry a little bit. If they can do that, what else can they do? You know? So. And by then you're almost getting warned a bit, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, it was like a, a very strong warning. And uh, it took me, what, two, three months to get up the nerve to call that guy back. Yeah. So finally I did. My curiosity overcame me. So I call him back and I was expecting him to look like a wreck, like a total wreck, you know, because of, uh, I mean, if something could do that, you know, they, it's probably tore him to pieces by now. And he walks in, he's got lots of energy and he's bright and shiny. And I'm like, Boom. You know, I'm like, well, why doesn't he look like a wreck? And I said, well, you, you look good. What's what's going on? I, you know, so, mm. you know, I would teach him the things that that I had learned about how to fight back against the voices. And he said, well, they didn't make any ground. I didn't make any ground, but they didn't make any ground. So it's like a standoff. 
You know, I'm able to hold them off so they can't advance, but I haven't got rid of them. You know, so I said, okay. And I, uh, he, he came in and sat down. And I said, uh, you remember the last time you were here? I said, uh, did you hear that crackling noise? Do you hear that electrical crackling? He said, yeah, I heard it. But he said, I was surprised that you did, me. I said, yeah, I heard it. I, I said, what the blazes was that? He said, uh, that was them. I said, them who? Them, them, the voices? He said, yeah, that was the voices. Now it's like, uh-oh, you know, the voices can do something like that. What else can they do? I said, well, what were they trying to do? He said, they were trying to scare you off. I said, well, they did a damn good job of it. Yeah. You know? And uh, you know, then I, I asked him, I said, you looked really strange when you left the office. You looked like a zombie. I said, um, what were the voices telling you when you were leaving the office? He said, they were telling me to go to get a shank and stick it in your gut. A shank is a, a pr homemade prison knife. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, he wouldn't have done that. I've worked with him for six months. He's getting better. He knows what he knows that I know enough to at least help him get better. Yeah. And uh, um, I said, well, why didn't you do that? He said, I couldn't find one and nobody would give me one. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. so much for that, you know? Oh. That that one, that I had closed down the office again for the rest of that day, you know? And it was like, what am I getting into here? What am I yeah. getting into? I don't know. There's no cognitive map. There was nothing, you know, Hey, this is what you do, or this is, you know, it's like this whole new world, you yeah. know, this whole psychotic world, and there's no map, you know, and I'm tripping over all these things. And and who knows whether I'm gonna fall in a manhole next, you know? Yeah. You know, this guy just said the, the voices were telling him to kill me. You know, I'm like, okay, so what else are they capable of? You know, it's like uh you know, that was pretty strange. So by the time by the time I got done at the prison i spent like 17 years there we had like 17 or 30 patterns that these things ran so i'm going to re briefly read down now what's what's cool about this is mm -hmm. that the psychiatric mafia and the big pharma you know took all their you know well it's caused by this and they'd move it up into genetics and they'd move it up into biochemistry that you couldn't you couldn't see you know you couldn't check the, the psychiatrist couldn't check the doctors couldn't check it was up into this this la la land of biochemical everything that nobody understood and it's too complex for the average man to understand. You know, mm. This isn't like that. No. Okay. So these these entities are energetic. They're neg negative energetic parasitic entities. Okay. They run these patterns. Okay. So you, we can't see them, we can't hear them. They can. Okay. Doctors can't see them. The doctors uh, Psychiatrists can't see them, so they just, oh well, they're halluc. We don't understand what they are, so they're hallucinations. We say they're hallucinations because they, they, they seem like it. What else could they be? Well, they certainly mm -hmm. can't be spirits. You don't know the Bible uh, twenty three times says that Jesus cast these things out of people, but the Bible's like two thousand years old. I mean, it, it's not relevant today. You know, what? It's a bunch of fairy tales. No, no, that's not a bunch of fairy tales by a long shot. They're yeah. still here, and they're here worse than they ever have been. So uh, they're energetic. So energy is, is, is pure. You can't see it. You can't feel it. You can't smell it. You can't detect it like a magnetic field. You can't mm. see it. Gravity, you can't see it. You know, you can see the effects of it, but you can't see it itself. Electricity, the same thing. You can see that spark, but that's a, that's a spark of friction with the air. You can't see the electricity itself. So like a magnetic field, there's energy there, but you can't can't detect it with our senses. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. You wouldn't know it was there unless yeah. you had some iron filings. So you get some iron filings in a jar and you put it on that magnetic field. Now you can see the outline of that magnetic field. Okay. You can see the energy that causes it. Well, that's what these symptoms are. That's what these patterns are. These are the iron filings for schizophrenics. This, this is what the entities are, you know. And what you'll notice as I read these things off, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these traits that the voices have and the mainstream media and the politicians today. 
it's the same entity on a macroscopic scale. You know, number one, I mentioned before, they're negative. They're completely negative. It's always negative stuff. It's never anything good. You know, look at yeah. the news. You turn on the news, it's always bad shit. Yeah. You know? Anti-religious. You know, uh, I did a test on that, too, is, is when I found out that the voices didn't like religion. I started asking all these guys, what happens when you go into church? What happens when you read the Bible? It's all the same thing. They didn't thing. like religion. Yeah. They don't like the Bible. They don't like God. They don't like Jesus. They don't like any talk of that. They want nothing mm. to do with it. So why would a hallucination do that? Wouldn't. You know, it wouldn't. They foster and create negative emotion. So they're always telling these guys, you're no good. You're rotten. You're ugly. You're stupid. Uh, you can't ever do anything. You're always screwing up. That uh, Endless stuff like that. That creates a negative emotion. It brings the person down to their low vibratory level. You know, so then the, at, at that level, then they can suck their energy out of them, but they have to bring them down to that level first. So they energetically drain their victims, you know, mm. just like listening to the news every night. You just go like, Ugh. they get louder after sunset. This is consistent. The sun goes down, they get louder. In geriatric facilities I worked at, the patients would get more violent when the sun went down. They called it sundowner syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of those guys were hearing voices. Now, one thing I saw with uh, working with psychiatry, I was sitting in the office one day with, uh, he was working with one of my patients and he kept changing his meds and the voices were still there. So the mm -hmm. psychiatrist, well, this was a psychologist. He, he, he uh, the, the patient was complaining about the voices and the psychologist said, oh, just ignore them. You know, just, uh, they're, just ignore them. Don't pay attention to them. I called that guy back a week later just out of curiosity. And I said, mm. well, you know, I heard what the doctor did, uh, said to you. Uh, how's it working? He said, it's not. The voices get louder when I when I try to ignore them. So I started asking all these other schizophrenics, what happens when you ignore the voices? Every mm -hmm. single one of them said they get louder. They get more persistent. You can't ignore them. Okay, That was another pattern. They foster yeah. self-destructive behavior. These guys were always doing stuff to shoot themselves in the foot. You know, they, they were just about to graduate from one of their vocational classes and they do something to screw it up and get thrown out of the class or get suspended or, or, or get thrown out of the, the program totally. They were the most self-sabotaging people I've ever seen. They were always shooting themselves in the foot. Well, wow. the, the voices foster isolation. Yeah. You look at schizophrenics and the families say, well, they lock themselves in their room and they just don't come out. They don't want to interact with us. They don't want to do anything. They just want to sit in their room. They want to sit in their room because the voices are programming them constantly, telling them all this garbage all the time. The voices don't mm. want any interference from the family. So yeah. the family becomes a enemy. Yeah. They don't want them to have any friends. They don't want them to have any family. You know, they want them to, to break them off from their family. So they'll they'll get them to act out to piss off the families where the families go, yeah, get away from me. You know, just go yeah. to your room and stay there, you know. And then they yeah. sit there with the voices and the voices work on them all day, taking more and more and more control, steadily taking more control. Mm -hmm. Then they hit a point where there's no coming back. There's nothing you can do but medicate them. You can't reach them anymore. You know? They demand the attention. Uh, uh, the, the voices demand the attention of their victims. They will not be ignored. You know, they, they, whatever the person's doing, the voices jump in there. They want attention. They consistently maneuver for, for increased control over the victim. Mm -hmm. They're always pushing for more and more control. That's why you see these guys getting worse and worse and worse until they get to a point where they're out on the streets. They're, they're, who knows what they're doing? I got an email this morning from a parent going, He's out on his own. He doesn't listen to anything I say. He's out on the streets. I don't know where he is. I don't know what he's doing. Mm. Happens. Oh, it's a common story over and over. once they take over, boom, they're gone. They they can't support themselves. They eat out of trash cans. They beg for food. They beg for money. Uh, they they steal stuff. They end up in prison. You know, and then they come out of prison even worse because yeah. now they're subjected to a consistently negative and violent environment where they're hardened. They become hardened criminal psychotics, and then they're released onto the street with fifty dollars once their 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 uh, sentence is finished. 
you did your time. You're done. Fifty dollars to live live your life. And they come out and go, well, what do I do? How do I? They can't get a job. Nobody will hire them. They're next con. Uh, and so they go back to stealing again. Yeah. They get thrown into prison. They spend their lives in the prison at the taxpayer's expense. So what, eighteen, twenty five thousand dollars a year to keep them in there? You know, and they're they're not useful to society. They're not useful to themselves. You know, so they, these things maneuver for constant increased control. Gaslighting. They're always gaslighting the patient. There's one guy where they told him that he murdered somebody and he was so gorked out. He didn't know whether he did or not. So he thought about turning himself into the police, but he went, well, if I turn myself into police and I didn't murder somebody, they're going to lock me on a psych ward. If I did murder somebody, they're going to throw me in prison. So every yeah. time he saw a policeman, boom, you know, the anxiety, the fear would jump up. These things were having a feeding frenzy with him. They didn't have to do any work. You know, they yeah. just had to wait for a cop to come by. And then his anxiety level would shoot high and they'd just drain him. They're constantly manipulating perception. Mm. So, uh, you know, just like they do with the mainstream media. I mean, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between this and what's happening in in politics and in the mainstream media right now. These are the same entities taking over these people. So, you know, the, the schizophrenic might be walking down the sidewalk and some people off to his right start laughing at something. And right away, it's like they're laughing at me. You know, it's ideas of reference that every bad thing that's happening is happening because of them. Somebody's following yeah. them. Somebody's chasing them. The CIA is putting messages in their mind or, or, or messing with them. You know, so they're always manipulating perception. Now, one thing's strange, they have pretty complete access to the schizophrenic's memory. Because they're energetic and because the memory is energetic, they can go into the patient's mind. They can pull up every rotten thing he's ever done and rub it in his face until he gets, they bring him down into that negative level again. Yeah. Yeah. I've had them go in there and they pull up stuff that the guy had forgotten 20 years ago that he did. You know, one guy borrowed a dime off of somebody, never paid it back. They found that, started rubbing it in his face, you know, 20 years later. You know, so they can wreak havoc that way. Mm. You know. But the whole point of just reducing your emotional state so that it becomes like loose or like a feeding ground, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're actually a, a, like a, you know, they're like these sucker fish that just suck these, these people to death, you know, so that, that's what they're doing. They're actually stealing their, mm. your energy that belongs to you. They don't want anybody to, to know about them. So they don't want the patient to tell anybody about them. Yeah. You know, keep it to yourself. If you tell, you tell anybody, they'll lock you in a psych ward. Unfortunately, that's what happens a lot of the time. Right. Or they'll drug you silly. You know, that happens too. Uh, they're consummate liars. They lie about everything. You can't believe anything they say. There's uh, two patients I've, I've heard of where they convinced the patient to poke out his eye. You know, they said, if you gouge out your eye, we'll leave you alone. We'll disappear and we'll go away. We'll never come back. Both of them did it. As soon as they did it, the voices showed up, started mocking them and laughing at them. Look what you did now. You, you Now you're a freak. Everybody's going to avoid you like the plague. You look like you look like uh, some monster now, you know, and they start mocking and making fun of them. That's the kind of entities they are. That's that's what you're dealing with. They're like gangsters. Mm -hmm. You know, they're mm -hmm. like bullies in school that they they just keep at you and at you until, until you stand up with against them. You know, and those medicines don't do anything. It's like pouring mm -hmm. Thorazine onto a magnetic field. It's not going to change it. You know, it dumbs down the body. But these energy and these these voices are energetic. You know, yeah. physical drugs are not going to stop an energetic being like that. It's not going to get rid of them. They don't. The voices don't like it because it dumbs the person down. They can't get a reaction out of them. You mm -hmm. know, they're so they're so tranquilized. They go, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, I don't care. Whatever you say, it doesn't bother me. I'm too drugged up. You know, that's why that that stuff works. In the meantime, they're rotting out their brains. Mm. that stuff should only be given to, to you know schizophrenics that are so out of control they can't be controlled any other way mm. otherwise you know stuff like what you're doing the the um you know kine kinesiology uh uh the mace stuff you know doesn't work great on the voices but it does work great to get rid of the negative stuff that these things feed off of in there it, it removes yeah. it faster than anything else i've ever seen 
you know, and then there's this gray spot, this gray area, where sometimes I would think that they're voices and they turn out to be negative identities. Other times I think they're negative identities, they turn out to be voices. So here's mm -hmm. this gray area where you, you just have to go in there and see what's going on, which one, which one it actually is. So they, yeah. um, they, the, these things, they lie about everything. You can't, you can't believe anything they say, nothing ever, you know, and even if they tell you the truth about something, it's only to come around and stab you in the back later, you know, so you're safer if you just take everything they say as a lie. They consistently steer the victim away from anything that might generate joy or pleasure. They don't want them doing anything that they they enjoy doing. You know, they want them listening to this crap they're hearing all day long. Yeah. They can manipulate feeling without speaking. So you can be sitting, these guys can be sitting there minding their own business. All of a sudden they get this heavy, dense feeling, you know, of depression. They, they can do that. They can short circuit reason, which they do a lot. You know, these guys do some pretty crazy stuff. Uh, I remember when I first got to the state hospital, this this one schizophrenic patient, he cut his penis off with a razor blade. Wow. You know, and I'm like, what'd you do that for? He said, I didn't need it. <laughs> that was his answer. <laughs> I didn't need it. Going, wow. Okay. You know. <laughs> so oh, I was pretty not... confused when I first got there. Like, what the devil is going on with these people? You know, it's like it, it, it was like it was jumping into the insanity it was like this it was like this ocean of insanity you know and i'm looking around like i'm scuba diving and watching all this weird stuff happen and going why did he do that why did he do this you know, what's going on here you know it's like uh it was it was weird you know? but like i said for a, an adrenaline junkie who was interested in mm. abnormal psychology it was like uh, fascinating you know, it was like, and in the prison, I would spend two, three hours with these guys sometime, you know, talking to them about their voices. None of the other psychs could deal with them for 20 minutes. They were like, you know, we're done. We're done. So they started getting curious. What is he doing spending all that time in there? Yeah. I, st I started getting in trouble when they started recovering. I thought they'd be happy when they started recovering. They weren't. You know, they put me under investigation for experimenting with prisoners without permission, without departmental permission. I would have never got it. You know, and I wasn't doing no. experiments with them. I was experimenting with their voices. You mm -hmm. know, what was going on there? So when these guys started recovering, I, I was put under investigation. You know, one of these guys, uh, uh, he pulled, fully recovered. He's a pretty bright guy. They came to him. They go, "What do you? What's he doing with you in there?" Well, Bob, he's helping us. Not like you assholes. Boy, that really pissed them off. <laughs> they they were really pissed off then. So the psychologist who was doing the investigating, he had a valid MMPI when this guy entered the system, and it showed the guy was, you know, psychotic. I mean, it was valid. He was psychotic as a bed bug when he came in. Mm. And he he asked this guy who said that. He said, "Would you be willing to take another MMPI?" So he said, yeah, I'd, I'd be willing to take it. So he took it. He came out non-psychotic, no psychotic symptoms at all. Wow. From, his, from the psychologist's own, you know, this is their top diagnostic tool. This is the best they have. And it's showing him he was psychotic when he came in. He's no longer psychotic. You know, so it's like, okay, Marzinski's doing something with these people in here. And he goes mm -hmm. and he shows the chief psychologist and he goes, he's doing something. I thought they'd be happy about that. Those psychotic drugs, those drugs cost a lot of money. I said, well, you know, look, if you can do this, you don't have to pay for drugs anymore. You know, no, they didn't look at it that way. It's like, oh, you're doing something you're not supposed to do. You know, so, so they, it just went on and on and on. It was like uh, the Inquisition just went on, and uh, finally it hit the medical director, and the medical director said, well, if he's doing something that's helping these guys, we don't have to pay for meds. That's good. You know, leave him alone. On the other hand, he's he's told me like you need to listen to these guys or they're or you're going to be fired kind of thing so the chief psychologist kind of stayed out of my face for a year more while this uh, this medical director was in charge as soon as that medical director left man he went back on me like a duck on a june bug so yeah. thank thank heavens by then i had enough time to to retire so i just i just hit the ejection seat and blew out of there yeah but yeah so you know the, the the voices 
boredom is bad. So you, you need to keep these schizophrenics preoccupied with something productive because the longer they spend listening to these voices, the worse they're going to get. Yeah. You, know, you have to divert them into something else. And you let them go on their own. They, they get these violent video games. They play those. They yeah. watch violent movies on TV. You, you can't let that happen. You know, you need to get them into something productive that keeps them occupied. You know, yeah. some some passive video game or something like that. So boredom is bad. Don't let them sit in their rooms. That's that's the worst thing you could do. The yeah. voices try to pass themselves off as thoughts belonging to the victim. Mm. So they they are um, they sound just like the victim's normal voice, the, the, the voice that you hear in your head all day. Sounds mm -hmm. just like that except their intent is very different. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, I, 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 there was one time I used this story a lot. I was out here in Arizona. Uh, we have cactus, so there's no lawns. You don't mow the lawn in most places. You go out and you cut the cactus to keep them from overgrowing your property. And uh, I have this beautiful white um, Siberian husky, pure white. And uh, she was just running around out there with me while I was cutting cactus. And she runs by and here's this thought barges into my head, chop her head off. You know, I'm like, where the hell did that come from? You know, it's like, and I, I felt bad just even thinking that, mm -hmm. but it, it wasn't my thought. You know, I'm like, right. that's, that's not mine. That's, a, you know, but it upset me just thinking about having that thought in, in my mind, you know? So that's what, that's how they operate. They hit us all. They don't just hit schizophrenics. They uh, hit us all. I don't know how many people I talked to that were standing on a bridge and they had a thought to jump off or one preacher was standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon and the voice was telling him to jump off. You yeah. know, uh, they hit us all to different degrees. So it's not just schizophrenics. You know, they're, they're out there and they're hitting us and, and they're hitting us now really hard with what's going on politically it's over the entire planet right now. There's a, uh, a very vehement spiritual war war being ranged right right now you know and it's, it's ugly so they try to pass themselves off as voices belonging to the client if they can get away with that then they got it made yeah you know they tell these people to do all kinds of stuff you know mass shootings uh murders uh stabbings fighting i mean just all kinds of nasty stuff mm. uh they foster selective forgetting. So a lot of times when I give my patients, okay, this is what you got to do. And you got to do this consistently. If they don't write it down, they'll forget it. 90% of it by the time they leave the office, mm -hmm. you know, 23rd Psalm, they hate the 23rd Psalm. Wow. You know? So, you know, that, that one patient told me, you know, when I repeat the 23rd Psalm, they react like worms thrown on a frying pan. So that's one of the things I tell them to do. It's like punching them in the face or slapping them in the face when you repeat that. They can't stand yeah. it. Um, they destroy any positive self-concept the person has. Mm. Uh, they fill the victim's mind with negative thoughts about themselves and others. So any negative thought, Sherry came, came to this conclusion, any negative thought about yourself or anybody else comes from them, comes from the mm. dark side. You know, And that's for normal people too. They try to pull the, the, the schizophrenic away from consensual reality, the same reality that all of us kind of agree on. They'll pull yeah. them further and further out into this horrible world where, you know, cameras are watching them and they're being shot with laser beams and the voices are chasing them and monsters are out to get them and people are trying to murder them. So they, 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 if they're not opposed, they just keep pulling them. They use confusion as a means of instilling negative suggestions. So they get the person confused and then they go, okay, this is what's going on. And the patient goes, oh, oh, okay. You know, so it's same thing hypnotists do on a different level. You know, they're averse to anything beautiful or positive. They don't want the person enjoying himself. They don't want them anything pretty. Uh, any attempt to form the schizophrenic that they're energetic parasites is going to get a reaction. You know, so... <laughs> If if you tell the patient that you better be braced, because there's going to be a reaction to that all the time. Yeah, if they break up marriages and relationships. They render the person useless, and they hate and torment babies. They hate kids. Wow. They absolutely hate kids. So you can see what's going on now with all this child trafficking, where they're torturing kids and getting the greenochrome. That's these things.
Well, I'm starting to get hoarse. <laughs> I, had a, I had an interview right before this one. So I've been talking nonstop for like eight hours now. Uh, no, I, I was just <laughs> thinking to myself, you and I have been chatting since uh, 7 a.m. my time. And so I I appreciate it. And, and I know well, we... What, what we time is it there now? It's uh, half past nine. <laughs> Seven to eight, eight to nine. That's... that's, that's Two and a half. Two and a half hours. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. My yeah. voice is shot. I, I, yeah, it's it's. I can feel it. It's not. It's it's getting it's, raw. It's I'm to, to... get to the end. So, look, we will we will finish it up this time around. Um, we could be here. If I could sit here and listen to you for another eight hours, and I'm sure your voice wouldn't approve of that. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> but, it's, it's um, giving me trouble. Yeah, I I cannot thank you enough for already oh, what you shared. Um, it's just been you're more than welcome. With, without guy, without people like you. I would be nothing. I mean, I'd be, I, I would just be out in the backyard screaming, at, you know, like, hey, people, wake up. You know, it's like, it, it's you people who are making the difference. Thank you. You know, so much. Um, uh, you're, without you, I, I would be nothing. There'd be no way to get this stuff out ever. Oh, it wouldn't it's come out. It's my deep pleasure. I know through my, through my own experience, my own work, when I saw your book, I really recommend it again. Um, if you want to dive more into, Jerry's um Jerry and Sherry's work. Um, I really recommend that. There's also information about um the MACE method, which is um if you're looking at uh the types of uh, methods and things that are often really good. That's there's heaps of books actually as well. Um, as Jerry said, an Australian man, uh John Mace, wasn't it? John Mace created it was the John Mace. So uh, uh you can contact uh Sheree Hatfield. She's in um Brisbane, she's on the Gold Coast, wherever that is. Yeah. So and, and she she does sessions over the internet. Yeah, which they found to be quite helpful for people experiencing the types of things that you've talked about today. Um, you know, I'd love to create another time in the future when you have time to talk about maybe more of the information around what you found worked with uh, with people. Um, the types of things you think people can do to, you know, protect themselves. Because I think, as you said, we're all experiencing it to one degree or another. Um, and it's just being able to recognize it and then be able to, to, to work with it, to free yourself of that type of thing. Um, knowing that it is something that's affecting us day to day. Like, yeah, it is. We're I, mean, aware. I think the one positive thing that I, the most important thing is get on a positive spiritual path and stay there. Yeah. You know, move along, read, read Emanuel Swedenborg, do yoga, uh, do meditation, do something. Don't just float there because if you, if you're floating that you're, they're eventually going to pull you down. Yeah. You know, if you have no spiritual backing, you have no, no spiritual foundation, they're going to eventually drag you down and you're going to get depressed and then, and then it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Yeah. That's right. You know, yeah. it doesn't have to be a religion. You know, it, it, just a spirit, a positive spiritual path, Yogananda, uh, you know, meditation. Uh, there's there's a lot of different spiritual paths. Mm. You know, matter of fact, the um, the Muslims know more about these things than the Christians do. They spend a lot more time fighting them, and 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 they're a lot more aware of them than we are. Mm. They, look, they call they call them the, the jinn. Yeah, that's right. They, they, they have special prayers against them. Mm. You know, designed specifically to to ward off the gym. Mm, absolutely. Thank you so much, Jerry. It's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure to chat with you today. Um, what time it is it there in Arizona? It's uh, it's four thirty p.m. Okay, great. Okay. Come up your so, so, so so you guys can visit my website at jerrymarzinski.com. Yep. So M A R Z I N S K Y. Go to the article section. There's a bunch of articles written by Sherry and I. There's there's tons of videotapes. There's a lot of information you're not going to get anywhere else. Mm. Use it. It's 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 free. There to help you. There to help you. Excellent. Thank you so much for the work you're doing in the world, Jerry. It's I think you're one of the bravest, most courageous people I've uh, I've seen. And just thank you for your bravery and your courage to to face things and to keep following your curiosity because I think that's, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the world that you've made a big difference to that never thought they would be able to have a difference made. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Yeah. I get a lot of uh, thank yous from, from a lot of people. It's like, uh, 
wow, look at this. You know, so it's, 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 it's good to know that people are being helped by this stuff. I mean, because you have to have the truth. I mean, if you're going to get to something and you've got to fix it, you got to know what the true problem is. It can't be hidden in genetics and bio, biochemistry and all, all this garbage that they're putting out the smoke screen. You know, this is what they are, this, this list of patterns. Anybody can see them. Anybody working in mental health can see these patterns for themselves. Mm -hmm. And if the voices are running patterns, they're not hallucinations. They're not biochemical imbalances. They're not genetics. That has been ruled out. These things are energetic, negative entities. They're they're like invisible vampires, you know. And they attack your mind. They 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 attack your spirit. We're spiritual beings, you know. Yeah. You can't see the spirit. You can't feel it. If you didn't have it, you wouldn't be alive. That's it. So psychology and psychiatry has given up on studying spirit because they can't. It's too slippery. They can't measure it. You know, they can't. You can't drug the spirit, but you can drug the body. They found that out. So they're doing a good job of that. Now they're drugging the entire population. Without doubt. Without doubt. Well, oh, well. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's us for today, but I look forward to hopefully chatting to you again sometime. And sure. again, thank you so, so much. And uh, look forward to catching up with you again. Thank you, Jerry, so yeah, much. Okay. Send and me a link when you have it. I will. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, Jerry.